Blessings to all the remnant of Israel. Welcome to the translation of the message from the Torah portion, Beha Alotcha, and welcome Yeshua, our master, our teacher. Let's immerse into the waters of his Torah, of his truth. May Yeshua give us the ability to learn from the behavior of of our forefathers, and may his precious Torah be written in our hearts, in our minds. We can do nothing without Yeshua, my dear brethren, and we don't want to do nothing without him. So in this moment, we ask you, Yeshua, that you will enter into the place where we are, and you will teach us your precious instruction. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you for coming. Shalom Alechem. Shalom al Israel. Parasha? Beha'at locha. Baruch haba b'ashem Yeshua Mashiach. Blessed is the one that comes in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. I give you the welcome to this gathering that is outside of all time since we come in different times. I am here delivering what the Lord is giving me in this moment and you are in another place at another time and therefore we have a gathering that is very virtual but it is scattered about at different times. I come to notice, brethren, that many of the wonderful gatherings of worship or where the Lord does tremendous miracles where there are many people and that there are recorded by camera or televised, they can be seen much and in different places and at different times. And all of these people spiritually are becoming united to what happened in one day and they're being touched by the work that the Lord did on that day, the wonderful miracles of healing of those who are deaf or who are blind that I've seen with, with and throughout videos, in reality, I have been there. And in reality, you have been there. All of us have been there united. And the Lord has done wonderful things in our hearts in spite that we were not there physically. Thanks to this new technology that we have, that we are able to communicate by making videos and filming and be able to see it later on. But in times where this type of technology of making videos did not exist, I know of miracles that happened, for example, in India, if I'm not wrong, there were miracles made in the beginning of the past century, in the beginning of the 1900s, where the first brethren arrived with the good news. The Lord himself would project on the walls images of what happened to Yeshua and in color. This miracle happened in India, if I'm not mistaken, and the people would gather and they would see projected on the walls before the technology of cinema had existed and in full colors. Therefore, the Lord also did it in the time and he did it in such a wondrous way by showing them what happened in the past because in Yeshua there is no time for time in the heavenlies and in the heavenly sphere as we can call it is not the same as on earth and many of these things can play games in our logic in our mind when we try to decipher what is written in prophetic visions the case is that Yeshua himself has revealed to brethren that time in the heavenlies is not measured on earth and there is no linear relationship or delineated sometimes a few seconds in the heavenlies is a long time on earth sometimes a few seconds in the heavenlies can be of a little bit of time on earth sometimes a few hours in the heavenlies are a few years on earth and therefore in those same terms we must understand when the lord is speaking to us and when he gives us visions is that what he's saying cannot be interpreted with our minds because we depend on Yeshua in order to understand a vision or a dream and therefore we must go to Yeshua in order to interpret the scriptures because there there are visions and words of the Lord that are defined and expressed in heavenly terms. This is just a small introduction in order to open our hearts so that we might enter into the portion of the Torah that is called Beha'at Locha. Literally speaking, the translation to this word, if I can call it so, because in Hebrew, words can actually be a phrase. For example, like this one, literally is in your arising or in your going up. There are three words, Beha'at Locha, in your going up. 
But let's look at what the text says and what Yeshua says, looking at verse 1 and 2. Ve'yadaver Yehud el Moshe le'emor, and spoke Yehud to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and say to him, Ve'ha'alot ha, when you arrange or going up it, the lamps, over against the face of the lampstand, the lampstand, they shall give light seven. The lamps is better read this way. In front of the menorah shall give light seven. The lamps. The menorah was this candelabra or lampstand with seven branches and the small lamps of oil could point one way and another. They are not circular and they are not symmetric for they have the light going one way and the oil coming a different way. And what the Lord is saying is that the lamps should be lighting towards the front and not towards the wall. If you remember that the tent of meeting of the tabernacle was divided into two parts, the most holy of holy place and the holy place. And on the left side of the holy place would be the menorah and the lights of the menorah, the small lamps would point towards the front, not towards the wall, but to the opposite side. Let us invite now Yeshua to come into the bonds of the covenant and so that we might have a gathering in spirit and in truth. Praise and glory to your name, Yeshua Adonai. We say to you, Yeshua, be welcome to this place. Be welcome to this time, this time that you have prepared for myself and for my brethren so that we might unite with you and that we can give you the welcome as our teacher. Welcome are you teacher. Welcome are you professor. Professor. Welcome are you, our shepherd, our pastor. Welcome are you, our prophet. Welcome are you, our healer. Welcome are you, eternal father. Welcome are you, mighty God, mighty Elohim, El Gibor. Welcome are you, El Elyon, to this moment. Inundate us with your presence, with the presence of your spirit. Manifest your power and teach us. We want to sit at your feet and learn from you. We invite you that you might teach us our teacher. We want to be your disciples. We proclaim you as our teacher. We ask you that you would teach us the secrets that are in the book of Numbers and in this portion, that you would deliver and liberate the wonderful truth that comes from you. We ask you that you would augment and increase our love for the Torah in each one of us and in our loved ones, and that you would do a quick work for the time is short, teaching us how to walk in your ways to love perfectly. Deliver us from all oppression of the enemy. Bring rest in these days, O Lord, to our lives. Bring rest to us in this Shabbat. Renew us. Direct us. Give us more of you, of your power. We open the doors of our hearts and we ask you that you would bless us. Bless us in all things. Remember your covenant. Give us the wisdom to walk in your commandments and allow us to embrace your covenant and see your glory and your power that you promised to your people. Thank you, Yeshua, for hearing this prayer. We ask for all of those loved ones and relatives that are not close to you right now, that you would touch their hearts and that you would give us and give them powerful tools to deliver the captives of all lies. For light is stronger than darkness, that it may be your pure light that would shine in us. In the name of Yeshua, we give you thanks. Amen. The Torah portion Beha begins in Numbers 8 and ends in Numbers 12. This parasha deals with many topics. It's very extensive and we might have to skip over certain parts of scripture and I recommend that you would read completely the portion if we are not able to do so. We will continue in verse 3 where Aharon is instructed of how to place the small lamps in this menorah, in this candelabra. And did so Aharon toward the front of the lampstand, he arranged to face the lamps as commanded Yehu et Moshe. And this workmanship of the lampstand hammered gold from its shaft to its flowers hammered work, it according to the pattern which had shown Yehu et Moshe, so made he at the lampstand. Let us remember that the menorah of the tabernacle, that it is a model, the tabernacle, of many things. The tabernacle is a model of ourselves. It is a model of our walking towards the Messiah. It is a model of the Messiah coming close to us. And spiritually, we have in us the elements that exist in the tent of meeting. And the menorah speaks of of something that is within us that must be lit up. 
There Yeshua at some point speaks and mentions of the parable of the ten virgins, saying there were ten virgins, and five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish, and the five wise ones had extra oil for their menorah. That's how it appears in the Aramaic language. Therefore, it makes sense that in us, inside of us, is the Ark of the Covenant and the tablets of the covenant, the mercy seed where the Lord speaks to us. Therefore, we must always have extra oil for our lamps. Years back, I received a word of warning from the Lord where he was saying that the time for having and taking the extra oil was coming to an end. And this is a time to fill our vessels with extra oil. And I don't know how much time we have left to fill extra vessels with oil. For as in the passing of years, the Lord has taken the message that we must wake up now, for he is coming. The bridegroom is coming. If you remember in the parable of the virgins, there were watchmen on the walls that would call out saying, the bridegroom is coming. They were awake. They did not go to sleep. But the virgins, even the wise ones, had fallen asleep and also the foolish ones. It was time to wake up the virgins. And that means that we have to fill our vessels with oils that time had already passed. The coming of the Lord is soon and I will always try to place much emphasis on this because I don't want it to catch you unawares. I want to tell you this. A sister, a small little girl, was taken into vision in the heavenlies and the Lord showed him, showed her a religious leader who had not been prepared for his coming and he had missed it. And Yeshua told this little girl that the reason why he was not prepared, it was simply because he did not believe that he was coming soon. Pay attention, brethren. Open your eyes. If you don't believe that Yeshua is coming soon, there is no way that you can be prepared when he comes. It is necessary to believe it. Therefore, pay attention. Do not allow an unbelieving spirit to come and take you, and it might cost you to be outside at the time of the wedding feast. This is a very strong message that it is a time to seek the Lord with everything we have and prepare us and how he desires a bride, pure and holy. And therefore we read from this consecration of the Levites. And spoke Yehud to Moshe saying, Take at the Levites from among the sons of Israel and cleanse them. Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle on them water of purification and let them shave over all their body and and let them wash their clothes and make themselves clean. And let them take a bull, a son, young, and its vegetable offering, a fine flour mixed with oil, and a bull, and a second son of the bull, and you shall take as a sin offering. And you shall bring at the Levites before the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall gather at the whole the congregation of the sons of Israel. So you shall bring at the Levites before Yehu, and shall lay the sons of Israel at on their hands on the Levites. Pay attention the children of Israel place their hands on the Levites and shall offer Aaron at the Levites a wave offering before Yehu from the sons of Israel that they may perform at the work of Yehu and the Levites shall lay at their hands on the heads of the young bulls and you shall offer at one as a sin offering and at one as a burnt offering to Yehu to make atonement for the Levites. Verse 16 says, For given they to me from among the sons of Israel instead such as open every the womb the firstborn of all the sons of Israel have taken taken I them for myself, for mine all, the firstborn among the sons of Israel, man and beast, on the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them to myself, and have taken et the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the sons of Israel. And I have given et the Levites as a gift to Aharon and to his sons from among the sons of Israel to do et the work for the sons of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement for the sons of Israel that no there be among the sons of Israel plague when come near the sons of Israel unto the sanctuary. We must be attentive to understand what are our giftings and to discern as we walk in the paths of Yeshua what things are operating in our lives so that each may function according to the functioning and the gifts that have been given unto them so that we might function as a work as a body where he is the head and we all have of his spirit in verse 24 through 25 add something to our understanding 
This what to the Levites from old five and twenty years and above one may enter to perform the service in the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and at old fifty years they must cease performing from which goes forth the work, and no shall work more, and that they may minister et with their brothers in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs, but work no they shall do, thus you shall do to the Levites regarding their duties. Chapter 9 the Levites were able to minister within the ages of 25 and 50 and would be able to minister. This is, speaks to us about a specific set time where they were able to minister and also a time for preparation. For from the time they are born until they are 25 years, they are preparing. And then they minister until they are 50 and then afterwards they are able to rest. There's also a time for preparation for the disciples of Yeshua that they will minister and intercede for their brethren. Chapter 9 and spoke Yehu to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai the year second after they had come out of the land of Egypt in the month of the first, saying, And let keep the sons of Israel at the Passover in its appointed time. We speak again here about the Passover. Do you remember that in Leviticus 23 we spoke of all the feasts? And before that in Exodus chapter 12, the Lord not only narrated how the children of Israel came out, but given the instructions of how to celebrate celebrate the Passover. And it didn't end there. It is mentioned many times in the Torah that we might be able to better understand how the Passover is celebrated. Therefore, here, here begins how the Passover, the Pesach, has to be celebrated in its appointed time. This is one of the commandments of the Torah. Verse 2 says, and let keep the sons of Israel at the Passover at its appointed time. This is why it is of uttermost important, brethren, that you follow the calendar according to the instructions that Elohim gave in his Torah, that we might be able to obey the commandment of Passover, Pesach, so that we might celebrate the Passover according to what Yeshua said. Do this in remembrance of me, and in remembrance of Yeshua, we celebrate it, that we might be able to understand the times and the feasts of the Lord, the calendar of the Lord, and how a day is defined, a week is defined, how a month is defined, how you, a year is defined, so you're able to know when to celebrate the feast of the Lord. Continuing in verse 3. On 410, the day of month, this at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time according to all its rites and ceremonies you shall keep it. So told Moshe unto the sons of Israel that they should keep the Passover, and they kept at the Passover on the first four ten day of month at twilight, within between the two evenings in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that commanded Yehu at Moshe, so did the sons of Israel. And there were men who were defiled by corpse, by soul of human, so that not they could keep the Passover on the day that, and they came before Moshe and Aharon on that day, day that. So there were certain men that could not celebrate that Passover for celebrating the Passover, you must be pure. And what does this term must be pure mean? Without any demonic influence, without any unclean spirits or impure spirits, without hate, without rancor and grudges, without fornications in our heart. Pure. The spiritual purity that the Torah speaks about is the same as the purity of the heart. For there are unclean spirits that have people get to the point where they have evil desires in their hearts. This is what the first believers mention when they say that you need to check your heart before eating the Pesach, which has been misinterpreted as a right of taking, um, eating bread and taking wine. What the brethren were saying, the first believers, was that you have to go pure, you have to check the heart that you cannot take of the Pesach if you have wickedness in the heart, because there is an unclean spirit of malice and wickedness in the heart of that person. Can you see it, brethren? When the Lord says to practice this and do it in remembrance of me, 
it speaks about celebrating the Passover, and this is what must be done in purity. And these people were impure because of uncleanliness of soul, impurity of soul, because they had touched a dead body, a corpse. In verse 7, and it says, And said the men, those to him, we defiled by soul of human, why are we kept from presenting at the offering of Yehu at its appointed time among the sons of Israel, and said to them, Moshe, stand still that I may hear what will command Yehu concerning you. Pay attention to the humility of Moshe. Perhaps we can see by today's parameters, by today's ideals, we can call Moshe a leader, a guide, because it is very much done that you create leaders in religion, and it is spoken much about that. But look at what this leader did who walked pleasing Yehu. You have the response and he says, wait and we will see what the Lord has to say. And I share this with everyone who believes that they have a calling as a leader that no one is asking you to have an answer to all questions. Hallelujah. This is a good piece of news. It has always been believed that in order for us to be a leader, we must have all the answers, but this is not true. We're not supposed to know all the answers. In a different way of saying it, the Lord is not pleased when we have all the answers because he has all the answers and we are only his messengers. Therefore, I don't know it. That is a good answer many times. This is the answer that pleases the Lord. Verse 9, And spoke Yehud to Moshe, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, Any man, if he is unclean because of soul, or on a journey far away of you or your posterity, and he may still keep the Passover of Yehu, the month second, on four and ten, the day of of at at twilight or in between the two evenings that they may keep it with unleavened bread matzot and bitter herbs they shall eat it none they shall leave of it until morning and bones nor break one of it according to all the ordinances of the passover according to all rules it's a good translation they shall keep it so the lord says for those who are impure because of soul because they touched a, a the corpse of a dead person they they are not able to celebrate the Passover, they're able to do so on the 14th. He speaks nothing of the unleavened bread that comes immediately after the Passover, but on the 14th they would celebrate the Passover and the sacrifice of Passover, and those who are also traveling, they would have to go on the 14th and they would have to celebrate on the 14th wherever the Lord would decide to place his name, which would be later on known as Jerusalem on the second month, on the 14th day. So what would happen if a person was out for three months and he would not be able to go to the first Passover in the first month or the second Passover in the second month if he would be outside? Then the person must celebrate it on the second month? My answer is, I do not know. Perhaps the Lord will help us to find it in the prophetic understanding of what happens with the second Passover. The first Passover on the first month speaks of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. It speaks of us coming out of Egypt, of the sin of the world, and coming into the bonds of the covenant. And the second Passover is also a prophecy of the second Exodus, because there are are two great exodus, the exodus of Egypt and the exodus of the end of times. Jeremiah 16 verses 14 through 15 says, Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yehu, that it shall no more be said, as Yehu lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as Yeshua lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries whither he has driven them, and I will bring them back into their land that I gave unto their fathers. The day will come where people will forget of the first exodus of Egypt, which was so great and so wonderful that the Lord took the children of Israel, defended them, opened the sea for them. They crossed the sea. He destroyed Pharaoh and his chariots, gave them manna and water water from the rock. He did wonders and marvels. They heard his voice on Mount Sinai. He stopped the Jordan River and they were able to cross the Jordan and they entered into the promised land and took Jericho. The first exodus will not be so remembered when the last exodus will come, for the second exodus is not from Egypt. The last exodus is from all the lands. 
So everything in the Torah speaks about the Lord and shows us something. The first Passover is showing us the exiting from Egypt. The second Passover is showing us the second great exodus. And therefore, if you are outside of Israel and you don't live in Israel, guide yourself by the Lord. But I visualize a second Passover that will be celebrated from those who are outside of Israel, and it shall be celebrated as a prophetic sign of the second exodus. Glory to the name of Yeshua for this. Verse 13, But the man who is clean and on a journey not is and ceases to keep the Passover and shall be cut off person that from among his people, because the offering of Yehu not he did bring at its appointed time. In not celebrating the Passover when we are pure is a fault. The Lord find us celebrating Passover, all of us. And it is wonderful to celebrate the Passover. It is truly wonderful that it is a feast that Elohim himself has given unto us, that it is not created by man. It doesn't have a pagan background. What a wonderful thing. It, it is pure, for his word is pure, and it is that pure word being lived out by his disciples in the way that we keep them. For Yeshua said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And because we know that Elohim is one and the commandments of the Torah are the commandments of Yeshua. Verse 15. And on the day was raised up at the tabernacle, covered the cloud at the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And from evening it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever was taken up the cloud from above the tabernacle, and after that would journey the sons of Israel, and in the place where settled there the cloud, there would pitch their tents the son of Israel. So if you remember, this cloud was supernatural, and the word here, Anan, corresponds to the modern Hebrew, and in the old Hebrew, as known as cloud. But this was not a natural cloud, it was not a vapor and cloud, it was supernatural. Also the fire, it was a supernatural supernatural fire. We know that there are supernatural fires that do not consume things. They do not consume things like the burning bush when Moshe was in the desert and when the Lord appears and so many other manifestations that have come throughout centuries. In Valparaiso, Chile, there was also a fire scene over some brethren who were on the top of a building. They had gathered and there was a time also of the revival of Azusa a few years after and there was a fire that appeared and the firefighters came to turn it off but it came to pass that there was no fire as of burning but it was a fire of the Lord and so this supernatural fire is what was seen in the tabernacle and also the cloud was a supernatural cloud it was not a fog I had commented to you my brethren that this cloud of the Lord I saw in a vision and it is transparent yet it does not allow you to see through. This is the best way I can explain it. Let us remember that Elohim is the same Elohim. Therefore let us prepare our hearts to see his kavod, his glory manifested at the same time as we prepare our hearts to be pure without blemish that we might enter into the wedding feast of the Lamb. May the Lord have mercy upon us and help us to walk in the bonds of the covenant for the time is short and we must prepare ourselves the problem is lack of knowledge for the covenant is not hard to keep but we have not known it for a long time and i speak of everyone jews and christians we have learned so many commandments in judaism outside of the torah which is now become very hard to separate it has become impregnated in the religion and the tradition and in the Christianity, the first books have not been neither read nor studied, and there is a lot of lack of knowledge. Remember that the Elohim himself reveals in the books of the prophets where he says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And this should make us to meditate that we must know the Torah, and to know it, you must read it, that we might not perish because of lack of knowledge. For the time is short, and we must know quickly about the Torah. And I 
asked the Lord for a miracle that his disciples might learn his Torah in a supernatural manner very quickly. Because believe me, brethren, it will be necessary to know it. And the time will come that this will become so clear that you must know it that no one will have a doubt within the believers and they will run all to learn and follow those that know the Torah because the time is coming close. Chapter 10, And spoke Yehud to Moshe saying, Make for yourself two trumpets silver of hammer work. You shall make them and you shall make use of them for calling the congregation for directing movement of at the camps. And when they blow, both of them shall gather before you all the congregation at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. These are silver trumpets. Usually, whenever you see the word trumpet written, the word that is used in the Hebrew is shofar. For example, in Psalm 81, tiku shofar vachodesh, blow the shofar on the month. Except when the sound of the trumpets, it is specified. The Lord shows Moshe. The word that is usually utilized is shofar. These are the trumpets. Verse 4. But if one they blow, they shall gather to you the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel. And when you sound the advance, thru'ah in Hebrew, then shall begin the journey, the camps that lie on the east side. And when you sound the advance, the second, thru'ah, then they shall begin their journey, the camps that lie on the south side. Also, the advance can be translated as the alarm, but it's really thru'ah. And when you sound the advance the second time, they shall begin the journey, the camps that lie on the south side. Alarm, thru'ah. They shall blow for them to set out, and when it is to be gathered at the assembly, you shall blow, but not sound the advance. And the sons of Aharon, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generation. And when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before Yehu, your Elohim, and you shall be saved from your enemies. And in the day of your gladness and your appointed feast, and at the beginning of your months, and you shall blow the trumpets over the burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be for you a memorial before your Elohim, I, Yehu, your Elohim. So now we're speaking of the trumpets, the silver trumpets, and the Lord says, that they must be sounded so that the encampments can march. They will sound the alarm through a, as it is said. For example, I have a shofar. I will sound the alarm and it sounds like this in what we know as the alarm. This will be the alarm of a great or a big shofar. And now this is the sound of a small shofar. And when you speak of only sounding it in verse 7, and when you gather the assembly, you shall blow, but not sound the advance or the alarm. And you shall blow, which says, u, which will be to blow or to resound. And the sound that we know today, This would be with a great shofar, and with a small shofar, it would sound like so. Here I am placing the example with a shofar, but let us remember this was done with trumpets. It is necessary to know the day of the new moon in order that all the sacrifices, the trumpets might resound. Many times in scripture, the Lord speaks that he hates your feast. And what happened later on is that the children of Israel in time changed the feasts and the calendars like nowadays. For example, the feast of the new moon is not celebrated on the new moon. Therefore, the rest of the feast are not celebrated in the correct timing. As we have read before, the children of Israel must celebrate the Passover at its appointed time. This is why we must know the correct times. So we must pay attention that the Lord hates their feast. He doesn't mean the feast that he 
delivered to them, but the feasts that are created, that man has created outside of his ordinances, which would correspond to a feast on the wrong day. Imagine a day that is so solemn, for example, the Day of Atonement, to celebrate the Day of Atonement on the wrong day would be to not celebrate it at all. For the commandment says that on the day, the person who does not humble themselves will be cut off from his people. It is a severe sin to not ask for forgiveness on the day of atonement, which is on the 10th day. This is why it is important that we follow the correct calendar. And the correct calendar established by the new moon, by the barley here in Jerusalem, the days also beginning in the afternoon and the weeks and also resting on Shabbat. We'll continue in verse 11. And it came to pass in the year second of the month, second on the 20th of the month that was taken up the cloud from above the tabernacle of the testimony and set out the sons of Israel on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai, then settled down the cloud in the wilderness of Paran. So they started for the first time according to the command of Yehu by the hand of Moshe and set out the standard or banner or flag of the camp of the sons of Judah the first according to their armies and over their army was Nashon son of Aminadav and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Issachar Natanel the son of Zuar and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Zebulun Eliab the son of Helon and it was taken down the tabernacle and set out the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari carrying the tabernacle these are the Levites and set out the standard banner flag of the camp of Reuben according to their armies over their army, Elizur, son of Shedeur, and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Shimeon, Shelumiel, of the sons of Zerushadai, and over the army of the tribe of the sons of God, Eliasaf, son of Deuel, and set out the Kohatites carrying the holy things and would be prepared at the tabernacle for their arrival. Pay attention. And they took it. The tabernacle is that the tabernacle is the Lord and they were taking it. And set out the standard, the banner, the flag of the camp of the sons of Ephraim according to their armies and over their army, Elishama son of Amihud and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Manasseh, Gamaliel the son of Pada, Zur and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Binyamin, Abidan, the son of Gid and set out the standard of the camp of the sons of Dan, of the rear guard of all the sons of according to their armies, and over the army Ayeser, son of Amin Shaddai, and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Asher, Pagiel, the son of Okran, and over the army of the tribe of the sons of Naphtali, Ahira, the son of Einan, these, the order of march of the sons of Israel, of the armies according and when they began their journey. And it is beautiful how we're able to see how the children of Israel rose and they marched, everyone according to their heads of their tribes. And we're trying to give a dimension of the situation and the cloud of the Lord, the presence of the Lord is going before Israel and our wonderful Elohim, the creator of heavens of the earth is coming with the children of Israel and they're all taking the articles of the tabernacle, marching with the presence of the Lord, a fearsome army, very fearsome because of the presence of the Lord, not because we are the children of Israel or something, but because of the presence of the wonderful Elohe Israel. Continuing in verse 33, And they departed from the mountain of Yehu on a journey of three days, and the ark of the covenant of Yehu went before them, for the journey three days to search out for them a resting place, and the cloud of Yehu above them by day, and they went out from the camp. And whenever it was set out the ark that said Moshe, Rise up, Yehu, and be scattered your enemies, and let flee those who hate you before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, Yehu, to the ten thousands of Israel. Hallelujah. Chapter 11 and 12 speak of things that are not so positive, if I might say, concerning the behavior of the children of Israel, concerning those spirits that were able to convince the children of Israel to go before with a grudge and with moaning and complaining. And we're able to define things that the Lord hates and it displeases him. One thing is complaint. 
and the other one is rebellion. And we're going to see here what will happen when the children of Israel began to complain in chapter 11 of Numbers. And it came to pass the people complained of adversity and displeased Yehu, for heard it Yehu and was aroused his anger and burned among them the fire of Yehu and consumed in the outskirts of the camp, and cried out the people to Moshe, and when prayed Moshe to Yehu and was quenched the fire, so he called the name of that place that Taberah, because he had burned among them the fire of Yehu. And the mixed multitude who were among them had yielded to craving again, so wept also the sons of Israel. So wept also the sons of Israel and said, Who will give us to eat meat? We remember at the fish which we ate in Egypt freely, at the cucumbers and at the melons and at the leeks and at the onions and at the garlic. But now our whole being dried up, nothing at all except unto this manna our eyes. Now the manna like seed of coriander was and its color like the color of bedellium. Went about the people and gathered and ground it on millstones or beat it in the mortar and cooked in pans and made of it cakes and was its taste like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when fell the dew on the camp in the night fell on it the manna and heard Moshe at the people weeping throughout their families everyone at the door of his tent and was aroused the anger of Yehu greatly and also Moshe Moshe was displeased. So said Moshe to Yehu, Why have you afflicted your servant, and why not have I found favor in your sight, that you have laid at the burden of all the people this on me? Did I conceive at all the people this? Lo, did I beget them, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as carries a guardian at a nursing child, to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where to me should I have me to give to all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. Not am I able alone to bear at all the people this because too heavy the burden for me. And if like this you treat me, kill me, please, here, now, if I have found favor in your sight and not do let me see my wretchedness. So said Yehu to Moshe, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know that they, the elders of the people and the officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you, and will come down and talk with you there, and I will take of the Spirit that upon you, and will put upon them and they shall bear with you the burden of the people that not may bear you yourself alone. And to the people you shall say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, for you have wept in hearing of Yehu, saying, Who will give us to eat meat for well with us in Egypt? Therefore will give Yehu you meat, and you shall eat not one day, you shall eat nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but a month whole until that it comes out of your nostrils and becomes to you loathsome because that you have despised et yehu who among you and have wept before saying why this did we ever come out of egypt and said moshe six hundred thousand men on foot the people whom i among and yet you have said meat i will give them that they may eat a month whole flocks and herds shall be slaughtered for them and to provide for them or all the fish of the sea and shall be gathered for them and to provide enough for them and said Yehu to Moshe arm of Yehu has been shortened now you shall see whether it will happen to you what I say or not so went out Moshe and told unto the people at the words of Yehu and he gathered seventy the men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle there are things that we cannot see when we read this section. For example, there are things we don't understand. The motivation of this mixed people that was passed over into the children of Israel of asking for meat seemed to be of complaint and it was a test, a test to test the Lord. It seems that the multitude who did not have a heart to follow and to respect Elohim, when they saw that Elohim was answering to the request as a form of abuse, they asked for meat, that it wasn't enough that the Lord was giving them the manna, but also they wanted to eat meat, testing the Lord. This 
is one thing that we must learn from this. Never to ask that it was better in the past before we knew the Lord. The Lord took us out of Egypt. Personally, he gave me a word in the first months when he rescued me and he said, you're coming out of Egypt. And we all know that in our lives, in every one of the disciples of Yeshua, there is an exiting of Egypt in order to enter into the land, going through a desert perhaps, depending on the plan of the Lord and how we react and follow him. Never remember how things were before he called you, before the Lord called you. Don't converse about it. Don't mention it. Do you want to be blessed? Follow my counsel. For when you begin to speak about the things you had before the Lord came to you and rescued you and forgave you, then the anger of the Lord might rise against you. We know that he is patient and it might be that he will rise in anger, but he will not execute any judgment upon you. But we do not want to offend the Lord. And this is what the Lord shows us and teaches us. Do not say how I miss how my life was before and that I had a good payment and a better house and I had more money. Do not say it. Don't even think about it, beloved brethren. So it seems to be that the spirit of these foreigners rose to say to the children of Israel to ask and request for meat. And it was is for testing and for abusing. You know, it is not so hard to find a spirit of abuse when you give much. And because Elohim gave over so much and delivered so much to the children of Israel, within the multitude there were many of them who wanted to abuse of the goodness of the Lord. Those who have worked giving food to the poor, those who live on the streets, the homeless, and you are able to see and know about these spirits of abuse. When you begin to give over, they just want to take more and more and they want to abuse of your generosity and if it's possible to even control what you do because these spirits of control and abuse arise in these people many times this is exactly what happened to the children of israel and this is also a prophetic sign i remind you the book of numbers is an image of the believers in the time of the end therefore here we're able to see what the children of israel did and we want to make sure we don't fall in the same error in the same mistake. Therefore, we should not complain against the Lord, for the Lord will take us out at some point and will bring us to the promised land. We're going to come into a great exodus, and there we will discover who are truly the Israelites. But the Lord limits to the children of Israel. He also talks about the mixed multitude that came with Israel, those who began to complain, and we should not ever complain of the generous hand of the Lord, asking for things that are not necessary, and never come to complain. The prophecy says that the Lord will have us walk in the desert of the nation and there he will leave all of those who do not please him and they will not enter into the promised land. Therefore, we must have a humble heart, always trusting in the Lord, always trusting in Yeshua and in his promises of the covenant in that he is powerful to bless and to protect. We were reading in verse 25. Remember, the Lord said to Moshe to get Gather seventy elders before the tabernacle, and came down Yehu in the cloud and spoke to him, and took of the spirit that upon him, and placed upon seventy the elders, and came to pass when rested upon them the spirit that they prophesied. The final part of this verse may be translated in two manners, and they ceased not, or they added not. It sounds strange to say, and they added not, but this is the meaning of the Hebrew word lehosif. Verse 26, but had remained two men in the camp, the name of one Eldad, and the name of the second Medad, and rested upon the spirit, and they among those listed, but not who had gone out to the tabernacle, and yet they prophesied in the camp, and ran a young man and told Moshe, and said, Eldad and Medad prophesying in the camp. So answered Yehosha, son of Nun, assistant of Moshe, and said, My lord Moshe forbid them, and said to him, Moshe, are zealous you for my sake? Oh, that all the people of Yehu were prophets that would put Yehu at his spirit upon them and return Moshe to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Here we see the spirit of the Lord was in Moshe, and the Lord took of this spirit of this unction and placed it over seventy more elders. Pay attention, Yeshua said that the least in the kingdom of heaven was greater than John. There is something that we have received in the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
that is greater, including of that which was in Moshe and which was in the 70 elders. There's a part in the movement of the Spirit, in the an operation in the Spirit that is in those who have been immersed in the Holy Spirit, and probably in those who have not been immersed, but have in them this blessing. The Lord says that John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets that had risen, but even the least in the kingdom of heaven was greater than John the Baptist. Therefore, we must appreciate the giftings that the Lord has given us. The problem is that we have become too familiar with this. It becomes so natural to us. It is so wonderful that the Lord has given the gifting of the Holy Spirit to many brethren, and it becomes so common that it becomes trivial. And this is very bad because many have committed great sin, even though they are a temple of the Holy Spirit in a intentional manner, which is very bad. We must understand that the treasures that the Lord has given us in the Feast of Weeks are tremendous for his children. We need to value them and we need to utilize them for the glory of the Lord. In this time that is close to the Feast of Shavuot of Weeks, we must remember and give him thanks for the great marvels that he has done with us. Let us not forget any of the great miracles that he has done since he brought us out of the land of Egypt. Let us repeat them, the wonders that he did in the desert, the ones that he did when he gave and delivered the land to them, the miracles that Yeshua did healing those who were sick or on the execution stake where he gave and delivered up his life and his blood and placing it over the mercy seat and forgiving us for all our sins. Remember always what the Lord has done for us so that we might not enter into a state of forgetfulness and open the door for the enemy. He is a wonderful Elohim who has blessed his people in all things. He is an Elohim that fulfills his promises and fulfills his covenants. Blessed be his name, praised be his name, and that he might renew in us the faith, the trust, the confidence in him that he is faithful and true, that he fulfills all covenant, all promises, and let us enter into the bonds of the covenant so that we might see his powerful arm, powerful hand in the believers, knowing that he is able to do it. But it is necessary that you must believe in Yeshua and more than believing, to trust. To believe is one thing, but to trust is more than believing. Let us decide to trust in the Lord. If you don't trust in the Lord, if you have some distrust, you must renounce it and expel it. This distrust and say unto the Lord, I decide consciously and in a voluntary manner to trust in you, Yeshua. Can you see it? Just say it, pronounce it, and renounce all distrust in the name of Yeshua and order all distrust to leave me in the name of Yeshua. The power that is in your mouth in the name of Yeshua can transform completely your life and the life of your loved ones. To trust in the Lord and to believe Him is only a voluntary decision and not something that the Lord is awaiting for you to produce. You cannot produce confidence and trust in you, but you can expel distrust and proclaim to Yeshua that you trust. In the name of Yeshua, I speak to you, for in his name we will tread on our enemies. And our enemies are, for example, distrust. Distrust and lack of faith and lack of faith in his name, we must expel it and we must proclaim in his name that we decide to trust in him. And let us continue doing it. When hard times come, we must continue to proclaim it. And in the name of Yeshua, for he has given us the victory. If we fight and battle, we will obtain the victory. Continuing in verse 30. And returned Moshe to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Now a wind went out from Yehu, and it brought quail from the sea, and left fluttering near the camp, about a journey of a day on this side, and about a journey of a day on the other side, all around the camp, and about two cubits above the surface of the ground, and stayed up the people all day, that and all night, and all day, the next, and gathered at the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread out for themselves all around the camp. The meat still between their teeth before it was chewed, but while the wrath of Yehu was around, 
aroused against the people. And struck Yehu the people with a plague great very. And he called it the name of the place that Kivrot Hata'ava, because there they buried it the people who had yielded the craving. From Kivrot Hata'ava moved the people to Hatserot and camped at Hatserot. Our ancestors in many times complained before the Lord. Remember that deceit produced that the children of Israel would unite with the complaint or the rebellion. And remember also that what the children did complaining is just a prophetic sign of that which is coming or that which the children of Israel have done throughout centuries. There is a spiritual rule that we must break that what happens to the fathers will happen to the children. The children of Israel in the desert complained against the Lord. And what do the believers do nowadays? The exact same thing the children of Israel did. They didn't keep the commandments of the Lord. What do they do today? The believers, they don't keep the commandments of the Lord. The same things that happen to the children of Israel are those that are happening to the believers. The same thing that the children of Israel did are repeated and repeated over and over from generation to generation in the two houses of Israel. When we read this, we don't do it to say, oh look, they were unbelieving, the children of Israel, how terrible they were, how rebellious they were. We read this to see and check our hearts to see what we are doing in our hearts nowadays to prepare ourselves for that which is coming. The Lord fulfills his covenants. If we embrace his covenants and his commandments, he will provide everything we need and he will conquer our enemies and he will deliver us from all sickness and all plague. Read the blessings. Leviticus 26, we will read later on, Deuteronomy 28, and then we will see how many blessings the Lord promises for those who embrace his covenant. But for the people who do not embrace the covenant, the blessings, if they're there, come only because of grace. And at some point, that grace will be removed and that time is soon. Remember what the prophet says when he sees a flying scroll in the book of Zechariah chapter 5 of Zechariah. Then again I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold a flying roll or scroll and he said unto me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying roll, scroll. The length therefore is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. And then he said unto me, this is a curse that goes forth over the face of the whole land. For every one that seals shall be swept away on the side like it. And every one that swears shall be swept away on the other side like it. This scroll, this roll is the Torah, beloved brethren, because the Torah is a curse if you don't keep it, but it is a blessing if you keep it. Do you remember the kings when all of a sudden they would find the scroll of the Torah they would usually say oh the curse that was written on this scroll has fallen upon us yes this is part of the book that is called the Bible it has curses and it has blessings the curses depend on our obedience if we are disobedient we will get curses but if we are obedient we will get blessings this is the covenant and we call it like if there's only one covenant but is more than one covenant and they're all valid and one is added upon the other until we get and arrive to the new covenant which is the blood of Yeshua of which the prophet Jeremiah speaks of which consists of exactly the old covenant the Torah is written on our hearts there is no new covenant without the older one for the new covenant has to do with having the old covenant in our hearts and in our minds and in our midst do you see it they're all one single covenant therefore we must fear the lord as the book of revelation says at the end in the aramean it says blessed is the one that keeps his commandments to have a right to the book of life revelations 22 14 the greek does not say that you should check the greek says something else why? Because it was changed. With what intention? With the intention of taking away the importance of the commandments of the Lord. The enemy did it so that his people would be cursed. And this is what we're confronted with today. Hard times are coming and it is necessary to embrace the Torah and keep the commandments in order to be under the protection of the Lord. And this is a new work that Yeshua is doing today. Chapter 12 speaks of how Aaron and and Miriam speak against Moshe. We don't have time to read it, but you are able to read it at home. Therefore, we continue and finish with a prayer. 
Blessed is the name of Yeshua. We give you thanks for teaching us and preparing us for the days that are near, for giving us a prophetic sight, for being with us and teaching us of your wonderful Torah. We exalt you and we bless your name and we embrace you and we kiss you. As Psalm says, we kiss the sun and we give you many thanks for everything you've done for us. We ask you that you would continue to teach us and correct us, taking us by the hand towards rivers of revelations in this time, that you would speak to our children, to the children, to the young people, and teach them truth, and that they would have discernment never to come again into the spirit of the world, but allow that your wonderful spirit enter just as he did to the 70 elders of Israel, especially the children and the older ones. They would all be in one same spirit and in the truth. Give us of your spirit and give us of your truth in order to worship you as as you are worthy to be worshipped, and that there would be a unity as only you can give. In this truth and in this spirit, it would fall on all of them on whom there is found the faith of Yeshua and love your commandments. And all of those who are listening to this message, that your unity would fall upon them in your spirit and in your truth, Yeshua, that you might give over to them an immense authority over your people that your name might be exalted and your glory be seen in all the nations. We ask this in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. The Shalom of Yeshua be over all of Israel. Amen and Amen.